assistant professor in mechanical engineering and in robotics. And so if you don't know me, it's because I'm usually in the robotics building, but I'm also part of mechanical engineering. Um, Simon Sponberg is a professor um, in the Department of Physics at Georgia Tech um, and Biology. And um, before that was a postdoc in Tom Daniels lab at the University of Washington. For that um, was at, in Bob Fool's lab in biology at UC Berkeley. And before that was at Lewis and Clark. Um, it was at Berkeley that we first met each other. And um, Simon was actually my GSI in the first biomechanics class that I ever took, taught me how to do surgery on cockroaches. And um, I've been- looking. And we're still friends, <laughs> even though maybe- We've been, um, I've, I look up to him as a friend and mentor in, in all my academics. Um, so Simon does a lot of incredible work incorporating neuroecology, biomechanics, tissue mechanics, and biophysics. So I'll let him tell you about his own work. Great. Right. Thanks so much, Talia, for that uh, really nice introduction. It's really fun to be here, and it's really nice to be uh, finally coming to seminars in person and getting to uh, talk to you face-to-face, uh, -face, although I'm really glad that this is also virtually uh, presented so that everyone can listen in. So um, I am going to tell you a story today um, about biophysical transitions in insect flight, um, and I think I, I want to start by... There we go. Um, let me turn off one of the lights overhead. No, that's too much. All right, we'll just go with it. So insect flight is a uh, really remarkable capability from both from a biological and a mechanics perspective. So um, for those of you who don't have a biology background, insects represent one of the four major times in evolutionary history where animals have taken to the air. Uh, there's the pterosaurs, the insects, the birds, and the bats. And insects are by far the most successful of this group, both in terms of how long they've persisted and how many species have diversified from that. They've come to occupy a, a remarkable number of niches and a, um, occupy almost every environment on this planet. Um, so insect flight uh, is, has been what's sometimes called a key evolutionary innovation, something that unlocked the new potential of organisms to diversify on this planet. But from a mechanics and dynamics perspective, it's also a really interesting behavior to study, because while we know a lot about the aerodynamics of fixed wing aircraft, for example, we're just now learning about how the flow across flexible structures pitched up at very high angles of attack like that are able to produce sufficient lift to power flight at the centimeter scale. In addition, flight is dynamically unsa uh, unstable at the centimeter scale, and so this animal has to be continuously monitoring its environment with its nervous system and continuously providing updates in order to maintain its stability and navigate around. And it all does this all in the package that's about the size of the palm of your hand. And I think it's sometimes nice, especially since I'm talking to a robotics community here, um, so my clicker is not working, to uh, talk a little bit about the challenges that our current sort of best engineered robotic systems still face. So I'm a real big fan of some of the new, uh, really impressive uh, bio-inspired flapping robots that are at the centimeter scale that are coming out from Rob Wood's group and several other groups, but they also illustrate some of the major challenges that we have in trying to design systems at the centimeter scale for flight. One of those challenges is control. I mentioned that the system is aerodynamic is dynamically unstable during flight. And so the control challenge is very difficult, especially in short time scales that are needed to update uh, the, the dynamics here. And so oftentimes in these small scale flappers, you'll see that they oftentimes have large masses stuck out on sticks, right? Which is a very clever engineering trick to stabilize your system, hang a bunch of mass around, right? And slows down the, the way that you diverge away from your uh, stable points, right? So uh, you can use that as one strategy to sort of try and stabilize, but it's still really hard to get stable flight for more than you know a handful of wing beats here. The other major problem that faces uh, centimeter scale flight is producing sufficient power uh, density to actually take off. And so this is actually one of the most impressive flyers, I think, because it's a fully autonomous flapping um, robot here. It just has a guideline for safety, but it's using a solar cell to power flight fully autonomously from any battery. Um, but in order to do that, uh, they had to actually provide uh, the equivalent light of three solar suns in order to power this flight. So there's a lot of light that's not shown in this video, always ask what's not being shown in your sort of robotic demonstration, right? Um, so it's still very impressive, but the power density of our sort of robotic actuators is still about 12 times what the power density of muscle is. So we're pumping in a lot of power, and even then we're only able to sustain flight for short periods of time. Now, 
these are some interesting challenges, and we could focus on the specific components of the system that allow insects to do better with power control or that kind of thing. But what I really want to point out is actually these challenges are probably going to be overcome in our engineering systems within the next decade, if not much, much sooner already. There's some really impressive work going on that's sort of cracking these problems. But what organisms really have is the ability to integrate all of these systems together, all these components together to create versatile, flexible, multifunctional flight. And so I want to compare the sort of performance then to what we see in this. This is a hawk moth. So this is a moth about the size of the palm of your hand. In fact, if you've ever seen a hummingbird at night, it wasn't a hummingbird. It was one of these guys uh, because hummingbirds don't fly at night. But these guys do. This guy's tracking a robotic flower that we have in the lab. That flower is wiggling back and forth in a pseudo random pattern where we're doing system identification on the dynamics of flight here. And uh, the moth can track up to 14 hertz. Um, taking a turn almost every wing stroke. Its wing stroke period is about 40 milliseconds, about 25 hertz. And uh, so this is in real time here. You can see it's flapping its wings. And it's doing all of this under infrared lighting because the preferred light levels at which these guys navigate is at light levels where you would have a hard time seeing the hand in front of your face. So they're doing these behaviors in incredibly challenging sensory and motor environments. And I think one of the frontiers here for thinking about how there can be a fruitful, fruitful dialogue between biology, engineering, and physics is to really understand the underlying principles of how the nervous system, the mechanical system, the materials, the aerodynamics are composed together to enable these kinds of behaviors, as opposed to sort of picking off individual component parts of the problem. And so that's what we really try and do in my lab. My lab is a combination of sort of neuroscience, muscle physiology, biomechanics, and biophysics that's trying to study the interaction of the nervous system, the mechanics, the environment, and with a particular focus on muscle, because muscle is what transforms in most biological systems electrical activity into uh, mechanical work. So I'm going to talk a little bit about one strategy that insects use that comes clear once you start considering this sort of integrated problem of actuation, power, and control in insect flight. So what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about biophysical transitions between the two main modes of flight in insects. There's actually two dominant ways that insects produce flight, and I'll talk about those in just a minute. Along the way, I'm going to have to take a sort of foray off to the side into what uh, to the mechanics of spring wing systems. So insects end up uh, flapping with elastic structures that create a resonance in their system. And we'll talk a little bit about this insect resonance and whether insects take advantage of this resonance in the classic way that we would think a resonance system can minimize the amount of power or get the most uh, kinematics out for a given power input. So we'll ask you laws flap at resonance. And then at the end, I'll talk about how we can transition this to thinking, to building this into robo-physical and robotic flappers. So for the roboticists in the audience, please bear with me. There will be robots in this talk. They won't come until the end. And they'll have a particular, very particular role to play in understanding this, uh, this question that I'm going to start with. Um, and then at the very end, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about how we can start to integrate this with our neuroscience studies, which is about half the lab that works on that I'm not going to talk about today, and how we can start moving towards, a fa uh, towards integrating fast, agile perception control and insect flight as, apply, as you might apply it to robotic systems as well. So I actually want to start this talk by motivating from an evolutionary perspective, in part because Talia invited me here, and I think this is something that she also has taken a lot in her work. And so I want to talk about how can you start investigating these sort of underlying principles of challenging behavior in extreme environment by starting to look at the evolutionary perspective of how these systems have evolved. And the work that I'm going to talk about today is a collaboration between my lab and Nick Grouch's lab at UCSD. So I want to acknowledge it right now because he and especially James and his lab have worked really closely with uh, me and Jeff and Brett and Ethan and now Ellen, who's here visiting as well right there, Ellen. Wave, 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 wave. It's always hard to get Ellen to wave. There we go. Um, all right, so Ellen's here um, and is uh, joining us to, to, on this visit. And um, so I want to talk about uh, sort of this collaboration that's been going on for about five years. This is maybe one of the most exciting pieces of science that I've really felt like I've been able to do in my career. So it's really, this is only like the second time I get to talk about it. So I'm really excited to be able to give this talk to you today. So the first thing that I want to talk about is how insects actuate their wings. And it's probably not the way that you would think that they would actuate their wings. They don't actually attach their main flight muscles to their wings. And so if you watch here, insects like most invertebrates have an exoskeleton, right? Their skeleton, the structural bits that the muscles attach to one on the outside, like this big plate here, right? And you can see the wings going up and down, but the main downstroke flight muscle actually starts here, and it attaches to the front of the organism up here. Right, it doesn't directly attach to the wings. And what happens instead is it attaches to this exoskeletal shell and it deforms that exoskeletal shell 
um, like an elastic dome, and the strain propagates across that dome and causes the downstroke. There's another set of muscles that go in and out of the screen here that cause the upstroke. And so we can look at that in an animation here. So if we were to look inside the animal, you would see that there's a large muscle going from the front to the back of the organism that contracts to produce the downstroke, and a large muscle that goes from the bottom to the top of the organism that produces the upstroke. There are additional muscles that attach to the wings that do small bits of control, basically like the trim lines on a sailboat or something like that, but they don't directly produce the power for flight. So the main actuation comes from this indirect mechanism where you're actually forming an elastic parallel structure in order to produce wing strokes. And these muscles in many insects operate a lot like our muscles. They get a set of neural activation, which are composed of these little blips of electrical activity that we call action potentials. They're basically little digital pulses of activity. And because these insects are relatively small, the whole muscle gets activated by one or very few of these action potentials every wing stroke. So you think of the insect's brain as sending out these digital pulses that go activate, 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 activate to contract those muscles on each cycle. And that's very similar to how we would contract our muscles. So when I'm walking, for example, I'm sending a large number of those spikes to my leg muscles in a repeating pattern to produce the gait that I use when I'm walking in front of you. And this is the standard way that muscles contract. And so I just wanna point out the under, we're gonna learn just a little bit of underlying muscle physiology here because you're gonna need it for this talk. So bear with me. If you haven't seen how a muscle works, underlying muscle contraction is a bunch of molecular motors that interdigitate with each other. We won't go into the specifics of that, but the way that they get potentiated, the way that they crawl over each other is by the release of calcium. So when a neural signal comes in and activates a muscle like that, the, neural, the, the voltage depolarization spreads across the muscle and it causes the release of calcium inside your muscle. And as soon as that calcium releases, it exposes the binding sites for all these molecular motors. Basically, the motors get to go, yay, and they grump on and they pull the muscle along and they contract. And so then your muscle relaxes by all that calcium getting sucked out of the system. And that causes the muscles to stop interacting with each other. So what sets the time scale of muscle contraction is both the release and the reuptake of calcium. And this is actually, this is a pretty fast process. For, insect, for many insects, you can allow this process uh, to produce periodic forces in the animal. And so for insects like the hawk moth that I just showed you, on every wing stroke, they'll send a pulse of activation to their muscle. The muscle will contract, calcium will release, and then, it'll, uh, and then it will be taken back up. It'll be sucked back out of the main interstitial space in the muscle. Now that's good. That allows the moth to fly all the way up to 25 hertz. Actually, some insects, some moths and other insects that fly in this way can go up to 80 hertz or even 90 hertz. But if you ever listen to a bee or a mosquito in your ear, that the pitch of their wing stroke is actually quite a bit higher than that. They're flapping their wing strokes at 200 hertz, 800 hertz, even 1.1 kilohertz in a midge. So they're oscillating their muscles much actually faster than you would ever be able to dump calcium on and suck them off. So somehow these insects, uh, a class of insects have evolved a way of sort of breaking the speed limit of typical muscle contraction. And you can see that because if you record the neural activity in these insects, that, so we also, I'm, I'm just gonna, there's one piece of notation that I wanna do. This is called synchronous flight, which is I think a relatively weird sort of misnomer, but it's what's used in the literature a lot. It's because the neural activation is synchronous with the wing strokes. It really actually happens at a specific phase in the wing stroke, but we're gonna go ahead and run with the word synchronous for a minute. But other insects do it differently. So like this bee here, if I stick wires into its muscles and I record the electrical potentials that the brain is sending to the muscle, the brain will send a signal to the muscle. It will say, activate. And then you'll get 10 wing strokes out of it. So the brain will go activate and the wings will go. Right? So what's going on there? That's a little weird, right? So what happens if you just look at it is the neural drive comes in, you activate, and then you get a series of wing strokes. And actually, sometimes it's like five, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's 10. It's a variable number. Somehow, and this is called asynchronous flight, meaning that the activation of the nervous system is not necessarily synchronous with the wing strokes. And so what happens, and I have the hint here, and what we're going to explore is what's happening with these muscles? How do they get that, how do they achieve that higher flight? And trust me, this will come back to robotics actuation at the end. They're with me on the top. But what happens with these muscles is a really interesting property. When the brain actually activates those muscles, it doesn't actually cause a very large contraction in those muscles. It basically potentiates those muscles and gets them all primed up. And then when those muscles are stretched, they suddenly pull back with a lot of force. And you can see that in this picture where here you've acted, they've activated a muscle, 
and then they they apply a small impulse to the muscle, and you get a brief material response, such as a viscoelastic response to muscle. But then after a, over a series of about 80 milliseconds, the force of the muscle actually rises up again before slowly falling back down. So these muscles are what we call stretch activated. They actually have a state dependent activation, depending on the strain that's applied to the muscle, actually the strain rate that's applied to the muscle. So you can think of this as an impulse response and strain velocity. And this is the impulse response function of the muscle. And so it has this stretch response property. And so if you think of now putting two of these muscles in an antagonistic arrangement, if you activate them, now you stretch one and it'll start pulling back that will stretch the other muscle, then that muscle will produce force a little later and you can actually set up an oscillation between those muscles. But that oscillation is not the typical oscillation like you would get in a periodically driven system. So in those synchronous systems like locusts, moths, and cockroaches, what's happening is you're getting periodic activation. This is a forced periodic harmonic oscillator, right? So you're just having nice harmonic oscillation. In this asynchronous system, you're not pacing the system with any external extrinsic forcing, right? The forcing comes from a state-dependent property within the system. So this is a self-excited system. It's setting up a limit cycle when it's activated and kicking through a regular repeating orbit because of the state dependency. So we have periodic force and, uh, and um, self-excitation going on here. So this is time periodic forcing and self-excited oscillation. And the thing that enables that is this force response that's in response to stretching of the muscle. And for a long time, these have thought to be two dichotomous ways of producing flight. In fact, if you take the synchronous muscle from a locust and you do the same experiment where you pull on it, it'll develop force while you're pulling on it. But then once you go to steady state, the force will just decay. It doesn't have that secondary rise in force that's, a, that's necessary for that stretch activation. So pe what people have thought is that in the different groups of insects like flies and bees and beetles, that this special ability to have stretch activation has evolved and given it a very particular set of biological complexity that lets it do something fundamentally different from what the muscles of synchronous insects that are more like our muscles are doing. But wait a second, let's actually look at the evolutionary history of this stretch activation and see if that story holds up. So my, uh, so what we're going to do for the physicists in the audience and the dynamicists in the audience, one of the interesting things that, has, that this is saying is that insects have two fundamentally different modes, one with periodic forcing, which is sort of like what you get uh, with springs and pendulums, gates, and one with self-excitation, which you might see like with this little water dipper or these little guys out in front of used car lots, right, where you're giving a continuous force, but it oscillates because of the coupling of potential gravitational potential energy and uh, the, the driving force of the air, or actually in cardiac dynamics, that's another example of a self-excited system. The Hodgkin and Huxley equations in there have a stable periodic limit cycle, at least in a healthy heart. And when that gets disrupted, that's when you go to the doctor um, or the emergency room. So these two fundamental types of oscillations are uh, both being used by separate groups of insects to create flight. But what my postdoc Brett did is he took all of the different insects and he went back into the literature and studied the structure of the muscles. And he said, well, according to, there's sort of some structural properties of muscle that suggest that it might be synchronous or asynchronous, that is have that stretch activation or not. And so he went through a many, many different groups of insects there are all different names for different types of insects. Here's the beetles and the flies and the moths and the cockroaches, one of my favorite, um, or one of Talia's favorite, I should say. Um, and, you know, we can, we can say, okay, well, if you look at that, look, there's been a number of different groups that have asynchronous muscles that have that stretch activation. But if one thing that we can do now is we have the phylogenetic relationship. Remember, all species are related through evolutionary time. And recently, there's been a good phylogeny or an evolutionary family tree of insects that has been developed. And so we notice that some insects are more closely related to others. And of course, many of the flies, you wouldn't think that each of these have separately evolved asynchronous muscle. They are all part of one big family that evolved asynchronous muscle. And what you can do is using Monte Carlo simulations of state transitions, you can reconstruct the evolutionary history of synchronous and asynchronous muscle through the history. And when we, when Brett in my lab did that, what he found was something very interesting. So the typical story that we've always been told is that this stretch activation is evolved in these four different major groups that are read there and have these specializations that make it very distinct from synchronous muscle. But what Brett found is that when he did this, well, first he found that like insects evolved flight. Okay, so everything from here over has flying insects in the group. Some of them have lost flight afterwards, but most of them fly. 
right? Okay, so here's the first evolution of insect flight. And then soon after that evolution of insect flight, the first asynchronous insect arose. And actually all of these asynchronous groups, the beetles, the flies, the wasps, all come from the same common ancestor that first evolved asynchrony. So it's not that each of these groups have evolved asynchrony independently. They've evolved stretch activation once. And then what's happened is the groups that are blue in the middle here have actually lost that ability. They've actually reverted back to time periodic forcing. And I'd say, okay, well, that's a sort of an interesting evolutionary story, but I'm not an evolutionary insect biologist. Why should I care? Well, there's something really interesting here. Remember I said that the locust doesn't have that stretch activation property. But look at the locust on this evolutionary tree. It diverged away from the other insects before the first evolution of asynchronous flight, before stretch activation ever arose. Well, what about these synchronous insects, these ones that used time periodic forcing, but they come from an ancestor that used self-excited oscillations? Do they still have that property that allows them to be self-excited? So what we did is we went into the moths here, the lepidopteran clade, which is comes from an ancestor that's asynchronous. And we said, do those animals have the same stretch activation property, even though they're beating their wings with time periodic forcing? And so what we did is we did some muscle physiology. There's some just evolutionary parameters that show that it's actually coming from an an asynchronous ancestor. So what uh, Jeff in my lab did is he took the muscle, the flight muscles out of the moth and he activated them up just like you would in those previous experiments. And uh, he stretched the muscle. And so here's the initial stretch and there's that material response. And now the key thing is that this is a synchronous muscle when it's just time periodically forced. After I sustain this strain afterwards, the force should just be sustained and then slowly drop off. But what Jeff found in this moth muscle is that when he did that, the force actually rises again and then falls off. So this moth muscle, even though it's being periodically forced, has the same underlying property of a self-excited system. It has that same capacity to set up self-excited uh, self oscillations, which is great. And you can actually characterize this with very time, various time constants. R3 is the rise time of that secondary force rise. R4 is the fall off time. So this is great, but it raises a question. Wait, well, then why do moths actually beat their wings every wing, activate their wings every wing stroke? Why don't they set up these self-excited oscillations? Why aren't they operating like a limit cycle instead of like a forced oscillator? Well, there's two reasons why that could be. One is that they could be basically activating the muscle response here could be too slow or it could be too weak. And so we'll take a look at that. And it turns out that um, people have previously studied the time constants of this stretch activation and a number of other insects that have that self-excited property. And they actually find that it uh, scales very well with the wing beat frequency. So that higher wing beat frequencies tend to have faster muscle response, stretch activation responses. And if we plot them off on this, so we see that it actually falls roughly on that line. It's at least consistent. It's actually faster than it needs to be in order to produce the asynchronous wing strokes at its wing beat frequency of 25 hertz. So the muscle is actually has a fast enough stretch activation response that it could set up self-excited oscillations. But it turns out that it's much too weak. So normal, here's, an, here's the strength of that stretch activation response compared to the neural activation, what we call twitch or tetanus is like a pulse of activation or sustained activation of the muscle. And just for context in like a bee or a, a fly that's using these self-excited oscillations, the force here would be about three times the force that the neural system produces. And even if we correct for the fact that we're not doing a perfect impulse response, because you can never do that in an experiment, we can sort of factor out and figure out what the filter should be and what the empirical impulse response should be. And we find, you know, we increase the force a little bit, but it doesn't get up to multiple fold that. So what's happening is that the neural, this muscle actually has a stretch activated response, but the nervous system is basically overriding it and forcing the system at a particular frequency. So what this suggested to us is that these two strategies for flight might not actually be distinct strategies for life, but might be able to be captured by a, sim a singular shared dynamics equation that can capture the transitions from one type of flight to another type of flight and maybe explain these repeated transitions between synchrony and asynchrony in insects. And possibly if we could then capture that in a robotic system, we might be able to set up robotic systems that have these self-excited oscillations rather than having to pace them every wing stroke. And we'll talk a little bit about why that might be advantageous. So the question I'm going to have for the rest of the talk is, are these synchronous and asynchronous insect transitions actually a single dynamical system? 
And in order to do that, I need to first create a mechanics model of the insect flight. So I'm going to take a brief foray into resonant mechanics here and talk about what's happening. So we can think about when I remember when I talked about the activation of these muscles, I said that the muscle is deforming the exoskeleton periodically, right? So we can set up a very simple sort of mechanical structure where we have an actuation element in parallel with an elastic element. There could actually be a series elastic element in the wing, but we've actually shown that this is quite small, so we're not going to consider it right now, although you can ask me about it later. And then there's, of course, the inertial forces and the aerodynamic forces on the wings. Yeah. So we can write out a very simple mechanical model here where we have the wings flapping, we have a deformation of a linear elastic element. We have a transmission ratio that maps this deforma linear deformation onto a, a kinematic, uh, to a re rotation of the wings, right? So this is just a relationship of the angular displacement to the linear displacement of the spring. And we've shown empirically that that's a linear transmission ratio um, for the moth. And we have some properties of the wings and the exoskeleton then. And so what we can write out then is a simple mechanics equation. It's really just a damped harmonic oscillator, although it might look a little different than that really we have you know our elastic term here k uh, phi um, we have to normalize it with this transmission ratio term to turn it into the uh, deformation of the because we're doing k as the stiffness of the linear spring not a rotational spring we have our inertial term of course and some forcing that again we have to modify with the transmission ratio and then in the middle we have this slightly weird looking term which has pi dot in it twice that's the aerodynamic damping remember aerodynamic forces are proportional to v squared Right, so this uh, phi dot abs phi dot gives you the v squared term or the phi dot squared term, and it like, keeps your appropriate direction of the forces. Right, so that's why we write it like that. So this is really a damped harmonic oscillator, but the damping is aerodynamic forces. Right, so it's basically v squared rather than v. There's actually no viscous dissipation here. There's actually only uh, the material property of the exoskeleton actually has structural damping, which is a frequency independent dissipation. We don't need that in this model, and that's a whole other talk that's really fun to talk about how that unlocks some properties of the mechanics here. So you can ask me about it later. But what we want to do is populate this model now with realistic parameters. And of course, the aerodynamics of insect wings have been studied to death. And so as we know the inertia of the wings, so we can just put in a sort of quasi steady of translational aerodynamics. These are all sort of the aerodynamics terms that go into this gamma parameter. It's basically just the air density, the coefficient of drag, the wing area, the second moment of area, the radius of the wing, and the length to the center of pressure uh, on the wing. But really, all those terms are just static terms that are describing the aerodynamic forces. The one thing that we didn't know actually was what the effective stiffness of the exoskeleton was because many fewer studies have been done on the material properties of insect exoskeleton. So Jeff took the uh, body of an insect of one of those moths, took it out and put it in a materials testing device that uh, he fabricated a shaker and he oscillated it. And of course, we just did, he just did force length change uh, this or stress strain curves on it. Um, you can see a sort of fun video of that. And by the way, we painted these dots on here so you can see the displacement. Notice the displacement, the head of the moth would normally be down here, or the butt would be up there. And when we compress this elastic shell, the wing moves up and down, the wing hinge here. So we cut off the wing. This is just the base of the wing. And you can see that that wing motion is happening both in this plane and in this, this plane. And so that's producing that downstroke. And so we can measure that stiffness, and Jeff did that, and, and you know, we get a system that's fairly well approximated by a nice linear elasticity, right? There's a little bit of strain stiffening um, at the excursions. We can put that in our model and not. It doesn't really matter. Uh, one of the interesting properties here is you'll notice that the area in this ellipse, the, the loss modulus, right, is not really changing over frequencies over several orders of magnitude, uh, and that's that property of structural damping of viscous material. We get much more dampy as you oscillated it faster, but in sex skeleton, that's a skeleton dust. But that gives us all the properties we need now for the mechanics side of our model. So we've got the mechanics side, and now we need to put in that actuation. But before we're going to do that, we're just going to take a quick aside to say, well, this is a Damp this is a damp harmonic oscillator. So that system must have a resonant frequency, right? A resonant, and, and that may be one way that we can design these systems to fly with less power. And so in fact, it, um, I'm going to do a quick side on resonant mechanics. For those of you who don't remember resonance very well, I like this uh, comic by Cal uh, Calvin, Calvin and Hobbes comic where Calvin is trying to swing on a swing, right? And a swing is a classic resonance system. You have to pump in a little bit of energy each cycle to build up a large oscillation. Right? And if you do, but in, when you do that, you have to do it at the right frequency. If you wiggle too fast or too slow, you don't pump enough energy into the system at the right phase in each cycle, and you don't go anywhere. And then Calvin gets really mad and is looking for a push. Right? So Calvin is operating way out here, 
But if you operate at a specific frequency, the resonant frequency, you get a maximally kin a maximal kinematic output for the amount of energy that you're pumping in. The other good way to think about resonant oscillators is that the total mechanical energy in the system is much more than the amount of work that you're doing on each cycle. And so that's really good if you want to build up large oscillations. But it comes with an important cost, right? If you're swinging on a swing, the next time you go out into a playground, first get on the swing, I encourage it. It's always a good thing to do, especially if you're in grad school. And then you're swinging. I want you to change the frequency of your swing on the next cycle by 50%. Right? That's not easy to do, right? You have to pump in or dissipate a lot of energy from there. And that's because you've built up a lot of mechanical energy in your system and you're not doing much work on each cycle. So this is a really good way to get large oscillations, build up a lot of energy in the system, but it's a, not a great thing for control, especially if you're going to do frequency control, right? Makes it really hard to modulate that. In fact, it's so hard that people have actually assumed that insects don't do any frequency control for a long time. And in fact, very few people have actually looked at the ability of insects to change their frequency. And so the first thing that Jeff did was he asked, well, are laws operating at their uh, resonance frequency? And he has all the mechanical parameters so he can map out where the resonant peak is for them off. And it's right here at about 12 hertz. That's where they would get the largest amplitude oscillation for the same amount of power from their muscles. But moths actually fly here. They actually have operate above their resonant frequency by about twofold. And in fact, this is a very robust result. He can do the sensitivity analysis to all the parameters in the system over the sort of entire range of bi biological plausibility. And the actual wing beat frequency is always higher than the resonance peak. So MOS are resonant systems, but they're operating above their resonant frequency. And you might say, well, why do that? So let's explore the control problem. Maybe the moths are doing that so they get some energy storage in return, but they still don't have too much energy in the system that they can't do control. So with a VIP team, which is a vertically integrated project team of undergraduates that we had at Georgia Tech, uh, we set out to sort of test the capacity of moths to modulate their frequency by trying to give them the largest perturbation that they could. And the team spent like about a semester trying to poke and perturb moths in all kinds of ways. And they found that the best way to perturb a moth while it was feeding from a flower was to buy a toy, a vortex ring gun that shoots a smoke ring of uh, a, smoke, a vortex smoke ring out at a very reliable, we characterize the flow of this vortex ring. It's very, very repeatable. It's a great little toy. And so what they could do now is they could shoot this vortex ring at a moth and it could cause quite a large perturbation by controlling how close they were to the moth. They could sort of get the largest perturbation they could without blasting the moth into the wall. So this forces the moth to do a very, very aggressive aerodynamic maneuver to correct and get back to the flower, which it's very motivated to feed from. And what they did is they then looked at what the capacity of the moth was to modulate the frequency of that wing stroke. And they found that hawk moths, while they're operating above resonance frequency, they actually have the capacity to modulate their wing stroke by 30% from wing stroke to wing stroke. So from one wing stroke to the next, they can turn up or down their wing beat frequency by 30%. That's really hard to do in a robotic system, so hard, in fact, uh, that RoboV and these other flappers have been specifically designed to operate at resonance in order to get the most power output. But to do so, they've, they've never been able to control frequency on there. And in fact, there's, I do have to acknowledge that there's this really nice paragraph from Rob Woods group in this paper where they say, huh, maybe it's not so great to actually be designing our system at resonance because it really makes the control problem a lot harder. But gosh dang it, we have to do it because the power problem is so hard and we need as much power out as we can. But if we were able, ever able to overcome that power problem, then maybe we could actually move off the resonance peak and get some control over frequency. And that's exactly what insects have been doing. Okay, so insects are resonant systems, but they're not flying at resonance. But that doesn't solve our problem of trying to transition between the two types of control. Okay, so I'm going to come back to this question about now whether you use periodic excitation or self-excited oscillations, how can we combine those into a single dynamic framework? So what we're going to do now is we're going to take that mechanics equation that we have for the resonance system. And now we're going to add in this forcing term, right? And there's going to be two parts to that forcing term. One is going to be that stretch activation. And so how do we draw the stretch activation? Well, the stretch activation is a strain feedback. So it produces more force when the strain or the strain rate changes. So we're going to treat it as a feedback problem. And we're going to make a little convolutional kernel that takes the strain rate and convolves it with that infinite impulse response function that we measured. And that's going to give us the force for any arbitrary time history of strain. The other way you can think about this is creating a feedback loop where I'm measuring the strain velocity and creating a force that's proportional to that uh, over time. And so we, we characterize this with a kernel G 
um, and a couple of parameters. FA is the magnitude of that impulse response that I measured in the actual physiological experiment on the Hockmoth muscle. And then we have two parameters here that are important. One is the time to peak. That's a parameterization of that R3, R4 falling, rising and falling exponential that just measures the time to the peak force response. And the second term is this mu, and this is our one sort of free parameter in the system, because when the insect wing is flapping, it's not doing this sort of impulsive strain. It's doing a longer time history of strain. So we don't know how to tune that force. So we have one tuning parameter that sort of scales that force up and down to produce the appropriate amount of force to produce the amplitude wing strokes that we see in insects. So this can be, it's a fixed parameter that we determine a priori before doing our simulations, such that in a fully asynchronous system, it's producing a wing stroke of appropriate amplitude. So we have this convolutional kernel, and if anyone's interested, or if anyone, if Shai's listening, he's probably really annoyed at me that I'm trying to write out equations of motion that have an integral in them. You can actually turn this into a set of ODEs if you just take the Laplace transform of this kernel. You can then write it out as a characteristic polynomial and plug it in, and we've shown that that actually produces, and then you can linearize around the uh, aerodynamics term, so you get rid of that square term. And you can actually do all the stuff that I'm going to show you from now on analytically if you want. But we didn't do that, so I'm going to actually tell you uh, originally, so I'm going to tell you about the simulation results from the convolution. So the second term of forcing then is just going to be our classic periodic forcing, right? Like you would do for any harmonic oscillator. So we're going to have two terms to FN, periodic forcing and this weird stretch activation feedback term, okay? And we're going to combine those with one other parameter, KR, which basically just takes a knob and it turns it more towards listening to the periodic forcing or to the self-excitation. And the feedback. So we have two parameters here. KR basically controls the ratio of the neural to stretch feedback, right? How much it listens to the neural system. So in the MOF, this would be turned way towards the neural system and the stretch activation would be turned down. In a B, it would be turned much more towards the uh, asynchronous. And then the other thing we need is a time scale that's really important. It's the time scale of the rise of this force, T naught, normalized to the resonance period. That's why I talked about the resonance for a while. It has to be normalized to some kind of mechanical time scale. So it's the interaction of the dynamics of the force rise and the actual dynamics of the mechanics of your system. So those two parameters then can govern the behavior of these dynamics. So we can simulate this now and we see an interesting property when we do that. So I'm going to take those two parameters, I'm going to create a parameter space here. And the first thing that we're going to look at, and we're going to fix all the other parameters to Hoffmoth level parameters. So all the stiffnesses, the power and all that kind of stuff. And I'm going to show a color plot here and the color bar is going to be a little weird. It's going to be a color gradient as frequency goes up, it becomes more red, unless the frequency is exactly the synchronous driving frequency. And then I'm going to color it in blue. Okay, and when you do that, what you see is this plot, you see that in regions where like the synchronous drive is really turned up, or where the time constant is improperly matched to the mechanics, you get synchronous oscillations, exactly at the synchronous drive of the pacing of the nervous system. But there's a boundary here that when you cross, all of a sudden the frequency that the wings beat emerges from the interaction of that stretch into act uh, activation, the mechanics, and the neural driving frequency. And so the, the blue is more synchronous, the red is more asynchronous, and in the blue region, again, the frequency is exactly equal to the synchronous driving frequency. In the red region, the frequency is emergent. We don't actually specify the frequency of the wing strokes. It comes from these feedback dynamics coupled to the mechanics, and so the frequency can change depending on the time scale and the strength of that stretch activation. And so that's again an self-excited system. And so this is a couple oscillation, oscillation system. And if anyone is a dynamicist in the audience, this will start to look sort of familiar when I have two oscillating systems that are coupled together. Oftentimes you have a region of entrainment that creates this very characteristic um, tongue called an Arnold tongue in our parameter space. And right along here is a boundary between the, where you're locked into the synchronous drive versus where you're oscillating at an emergent frequency. And so this is actually an entrainment boundary and we can show explicitly that's what's happening around here is that um, up until this boundary, you're the, any stretch activation is still entrained to the synchronous activation of the system. And then once you cross this boundary, you leave the entrainment region and you actually get that emergent frequency. So, that, and again, we can show that uh, that actually follows in the linearized system when we solve it out, that follows a very classic Hopf bifurcation. So we can actually draw out the specific eigenvalues for the system and show that that's exactly where that crossing of where that eigenvalue flips over um, is where you get this emergence of self-excited oscillations. 
But something even more interesting happens when you look at this parameter space and you look at the kinds of oscillations that are produced. So that's just the frequency of the oscillation. We can also look at the actual amplitude or power of that oscillation. And you'll notice that in some regions, the system is oscillating, but it's not really oscillating with much power. Here, the stretch activation is really powerful and the periodic drive are really powerful, but they're not matched well in terms of frequency. And so you get actually a lot of destructive interference and the whole system just sort of sits there and vibrates at weird frequencies, sometimes often varying uh, incoherent. And here you get nice large oscillations. This is sort of a, this is a sort of phase diagram, right? So we're getting large orbits, large high power wing strokes here, large high power wing strokes here. But you'll notice that there's a region even along the entrainment boundary where we can get fairly uh, coherent high power wing strokes. And in fact, if I change this plot to represent the power from the wing stroke, we actually see that there's a region of synchronous drive that's very powerful. Here's the entrainment boundary. Here's the region in the asynchronous drive that has high power. And then if those two frequencies are closely matched, you can actually create high power wing strokes all the way through. So there's a bridge in parameter space, a pretty classic bridge across an entrainment boundary here, where if you're matched up with the appropriate time scales and the appropriate strength of your oscillations, you can transition from one side to the other. You might ask, where is the hawk moth on here? So you can get these regions of high power even in that intermediate range, but the moth isn't actually that close to that bridge. It's become specialized off into the quarter of this synchronous domain. So it's moved away from that bridge. And we hypothesize that that may be one reason why moths and all of its relatives haven't ever transitioned back to being asynchronous, whereas other groups of insects have switched back and forth multiple times. We hypothesize, but we, do not, we haven't done the study yet, to know if they actually sit on this bridge in terms of evolutionary parameter space. But the next thing you might want to know is, okay, can we do anything with this system? So finally, I get to the robotics a little bit. First, first I'm going to talk about a dynamically scaled robo-physical system. So a dynamically scaled flapper where we built up a flapper. You say Nick's lab has built up a flapper. that's flapping a wing at the dynamically scale so the Reynolds numbers match in a fluid tank of water. But this is very different from some of the classic um, uh, robo-flappers that you may have seen before, may have seen talks about, because what they've done is in parallel to the motor, they've added a, uh, a torsional spring. And that torsional spring is built of a cylinder of silicone, which actually has that structural damping characteristic too. So we can actually keep all the damping properties the same. We've sort of played with that parameter as well. But what this does is it creates a parallel elasticity to our actuation. So in previous systems like the RoboFly from Michael Dickinson's group or, Jim, uh, or Ellington's classic uh, robotic Manduka sexo, they built dynamically scaled flapping robots where you kinematically prescribe the movements of the wings. And this is exactly what you want to do if you want to study the aerodynamics of the wings, which is the purpose of those studies. In our system, we don't actually kinematically prescribe what the wings are going to do. Instead, the wing stroke emerges from the interaction of our periodic drive, our silicone spring that we have there, our parallel elastic element. And in our new system, what we do is now we clamp in a virtual stretch activation. So we make a feedback loop that measures the strain, the, the velocity of the motor. And then when the wing has a load on it, that wing can stretch, the motor can be back driven, and you change the drive to the motor to implement a stretch activation response in the motor. And we can tune the time constant of that stretch activation response and tune the strength of that. So we basically clamped in using Simulink real-time desktop, uh, a, a sort of stretch activation response into even a DC motor uh, here can have that property because we basically created a feedback loop. So now we have a system that we can either periodically drive or we can activate with stretch activation and we can look at what wing strokes emerge. And so now because we have a robo-physical system, we can actually do experiments across that entire range of parameter space. We don't have to simulate. So these are all actually experimentally result uh, experimental outcomes of different frequencies of oscillation that have emerged at different choices of parameter value kr and t naught over tn. And you can see that again, we have that Arnold tongue, that entrainment region, where the robo physical system now can transition from synchronous periodic drive self excited oscillations. And again, just, and it, there are some small regions here where we don't get any oscillation at all. And that's because of friction. You have to have sort of sufficient uh, power in the system or else it just fully amps out. And again, just as before, we have this bridge where you can actually, if the frequencies are matched appropriately, you can transition from synchronous drive to asynchronous drive or from periodic driving forces to self-excited oscillations. <clears throat> 
And so there's the bridge and power across the robophysical system. So we've been able to take that robophysical system so that we can recapitulate the transition between those dynamics, even in a real system where we might not have perfectly described previously the aerodynamic interactions. For example, we were using quasi-steady aerodynamic approximations. And then here's the asynchronous regions that we still have before, and there's still a bridge going across there. So we still have that high power transition. That we can achieve. So then the next question was, can we do this at the insect scale? So taking the RoboB platform, uh, our collaborative team is now developed in way of implementing that same simulant controller, but on the piezoelectric actuator that actuates the wings of so these RoboBs, the way they work is that they have an airfoil, it's attached to a piezo, and this piezo is actuated at specific frequencies, typically in a periodically driven system. And that's how all those RoboBs fly, they periodically actuate that piezo back and forth. What we're going to do now is we're going to add a displacement sensor that measures the displacement of that piezo. We're going to couple in a feedback loop to the voltage to the current to the voltage control of that piezo, and we're going to now clamp in a virtual stretch activation to that actuator. Now we're going to try and make an asynchronous robo B, one that responds with self-excited oscillations. And so uh, uh, James, when he did this, he built this up and he built the nice actuated system and he set it up to start oscillating and he turned it on and it did nothing, just sat there. And then he realized, oh wait, it's a stretch activated system. It's sitting at its fixed point. It's just sitting at zero and it's not moving anywhere. And we're, so we need to kick it. So he took a page from our undergraduates and he bought himself his own vortex gun, slightly different model. And he shot the vortex gun at the uh, Robo B. So here's the Robo B. This is on, fully actuated, but it's not doing anything yet. And then you shoot the vortex at it. And the first vortex comes in and misses. And the second vortex comes in and hits. And now, bam, you start getting an excitation that persists after that. Okay. And we can actually trace that out. So here's it's now slowed down. Here's the actu activated Robo B. The vortex comes in. It applies that initial stretch that kicks you off that. Uh, unstable fixed point um, at rest and now kicks you up to the limit cycle. And now you start to get that stable oscillation that's occurring. And we can actually plot that out in phase space and we see a nice entrainment to that uh, new emergent frequency, that oscillation. And I just want to show the, the next step that we wanted to do was not just create an asynchronous robo one that's in self-excite, but we wanted to see if we could transition back and forth across these two parameters, and I am almost done. So I'm, I'm watching that. I wanna just get to the robotic implications of this in the last couple of slides. So what uh, James did is he built one of these systems and he started it with a periodic drive. So he set KR to one, which means that it's a fully periodically driven system. So that robo B there is simply oscillating uh, with a periodic drive at a specific frequency that we're pacing the system. With. And we're gonna keep pacing the system at that frequency, but we're gonna start turning up the stretch activation here. And I want you to watch what happens. So as we start turning up the stretch activation, KR is gonna start dropping down towards zero. And initially there's a destructive interference between the stretch activation and the periodic activation because we weren't sitting right on that bridge. We were sitting in a different part of parameter space. And so the wing stroke starts to die down and it starts to vibrate. But then once the periodic forcing gets weak enough compared to the amplitude of the stretch activation, now the stretch activation kicks in and we start to get self-excited oscillations that are gonna start happening right here. And because the system is already starting to flap a little bit, it's got that kick it already needs to kick it up into the self-excited oscillations, which are starting to happen right now. And I want you to notice the frequency has changed, right? We've popped up to a new emergent frequency about three times the uh, synchronous driving frequency that we're doing. So we're still pacing this system at 20 Hertz, but it's oscillating at 67 Hertz now because we've kicked in that self-excited oscillation of the stretch activation. So this is the first time that I know of that people have created self-excited flappers that can oscillate at emergent frequencies that come from the mechanics rather than from the driving frequency. And you might say, okay, well, that's really cool. And maybe this can explain some of why insects have been able to transition back and forth, but I'm not an evolutionary biologist. Well, I uh, do have some background in evolutionary biology, but you may not be an evolutionary biologist. So you might not care about what happened to insects 300 million years ago. So why might you care about this from a robotic standpoint? Well, what are the advantages of using this self-excited system? Let me point you to two things that happen with these self-excited systems that we can actually show with James's uh, robophysical model. One is what happens when the mass of the system suddenly changes? So James built a system where he now has an inertial plate that's rotating with the wing, right? It's oscillating back and forth. And what he's gonna do is he's gonna release a ring of mass onto that plate. So it's suddenly gonna increase the inertia of the system. 
And so if you're periodically driving this system, what's going to happen right now, all of a sudden you have a lot more inertia, you're going to oscillate a lot less, right? But actually, here's what the robophysical system does in immediate, and we haven't done anything to control. It's just the exact same system. As we plot the mass on, all of a sudden, the mechanical time constants of the system has changed because we changed the resonant period and the time scale so that Tn uh, has changed. And so the emergent frequency actually changes. It slows down and we get a larger wing stroke out of it. So this system can automatically adjust its frequency and its amplitude um, in favorable or unfavorable ways, depending on where you are in parameter space, to these inertial changes. And this might be very favorable to insects and actually a property that we've known about insects' wings. If you trim part of the insect wings, they'll adopt new frequencies, but it's not because they're at resonance. It's because of the interaction of the stretch activation in their muscles and the resonant frequency of the system. So what was long thought to be a property of the resonance system of the, the insects is actually a property of their muscles having the stretch activation in there, which for the biologists in the audience uh, is a really interesting little feature about insect evolution. Um, the other thing that, and so this can be a nice smooth function. The other thing that can happen is I want you to watch this B for a second. And what happens when this B flies through the string? You see the little faint white line here? There's a little trip line here that's been hung. And this is a collaboration with Andrew Montcastle and Stacey Combs's group. Um, they took, took this original video with Nick Ravish when he was at Harvard, which is the same time Talia was there. And I want you to watch what happens when this B hits that trip line. So it's going to come in and watch the wing here, right? It's going to hit the trip line right about there, and it just stops. Notice the wing on the other side stops too, right? And then it loses contact with the trip wire, and it takes up again. This is all happening in about 10 milliseconds because the, wing, the bee is oscillating its wings about once every five milliseconds, and there's about a two wing stroke period in between there. So if you think about having a periodically driven system and you collide with something, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to keep cranking energy into that motor, right? Trying to get it to be back and forth. So you're going to be fighting against that physical structure. But if you have a self-excited system that's measuring the strain on that, you might get a very different property. So what James did is in his robo-physical flyer, he put a little patch mechanism that he could click into place really fast and catch the wing at a specific phase in the wing stroke. And when he did that, he applied the, uh, he applied the catch. And of course, the system just stopped. And in fact, there's current to the motor, the voltage to the, uh, to the motor just stopped. Because again, it just has that feedback cycle. And since it's not being stretched anymore, the whole feedback cycle just rings down really quickly and just stops. But the coolest thing is when you release it, because there's an aerodynamic fluctuations on the wing, you get that immediate kickback. And as soon as you release it, you get the wing strokes coming right back. Okay, so this system can stop and return to a physical block in the system. So these self-excited oscillations have some really interesting properties for actuation control that I think have been underappreciated. Um, and what's especially interesting now is we can actually enter regimes where you get a mixture of actuate to self-periodic actuation and uh, self-excited uh, uh, periodic time, periodic activation and self-excited oscillations. So what I've shown you today is that there's these, out by looking at the evolutionary history, we can actually find some interesting features about the transitions in insects we showed that a synchronous time periodically driven insect actually reverted from the self-excited property uh, through its evolutionary history. We showed that that insect that, had, was, that evolved from asynchronous ancestors actually still has that stretch activation property. And in, in doing so, it creates a resonance system, but does not flap at its resonance frequency. It actually sacrifices power for control. And then we were able to build robophysical and robotic systems that capture these two main modes of flight and can transition between them. And the last thing that I just want to say is that this really shows some of the power, I think, of taking these approaches. Um, oftentimes, the keys to an organism's agility and performance is in the composition of their actuation sensing and mechanics rather than in components of themselves. And I think we need a lot more of these integrated studies when we're trying to do bio-inspired engineering on that side. And oftentimes, starting with the evolutionary and the physiology can give us new insights and strategies for agile and centimeter scale flight. And with that, I'll thank you and say, and finish. That's sort of jumping into your evolutionary biology background. Uh, you mentioned initially that the, uh, the synchronous mode developed first mm -hmm. and the asynchronous. Uh, you're referring to the hawk, hawk moth. Uh, so uh, is, it, uh, is it presumed that it at one time was fully asynchronous and then possibly as the body mass changed, it sort of right. evolved back to this sort of 
evolved back, I wouldn't say devolved, but that's sort of the direct thing. Yeah, so just to recap this synchronous, it's not the hawk moth itself, it's the common ancestor of the hawk moth and the other species of insects. So way back in evolutionary time, actually about uh, about 300 million years ago, this the first insect arose and uh, that had a synchronous flight. And then all of these insects are ancestors of it from about here over. And so all the red ones here have sort of sustained it from an evolutionary history, but all of the blue groups have reverted back to that time periodic drop. And that was our key that maybe if we looked at the muscle here, even though it's reverted back, it might still have that property and that ability to be self-excited. As opposed to the locust here, which was the first one that I showed you that didn't have that stretch activated property, which the, if it split off before this transition. See, it's in sort of this group over here before asynchrony ever evolved. So that physiological property, and this from a biological perspective, this is sort of rewriting a lot of the evolutionary history of insect, because it was always thought that these sort of, these were independent evolutions of stretch activation, and they must have all their own sophisticated, specialized uh, properties that have evolved in order to let these groups sort of exceed the speed limits set by all of their related relatives. But exactly what you're saying is what happened here. As the body mass increased again from a smaller body mass ancestor, these guys reverted back to time periodic actuation. But I do want to say they could actually still use um, asynchronous activation, even being big. In fact, there's, maw, there's insects in this group in the hemipterans that are much bigger than moths, but still use asynchronous actuation, even though they only beat their wings at about 20 hertz. So both strategies can work. Yeah, that's, yeah. I think my question is related to this question in that like these secondarily synchronous, could they still be using that stretch actuation? Yeah. It's just that the inertia of their wings are such that the frequency is going to be similar to the, the um, neural signal. So we can answer that question for moths, and the answer is no, not quite. Um, because again, if we go back to our parameter space, that's a good, that's certainly a possibility, but it's not what happens here. Mm -hmm. If we look at the moth on its parameter space, it would need to be on this sort of horizontal to have the right time constant for the stretch activation to match up. So it actually has some stretch act. The answer is sort of like, it's actually pretty close to that. So there is a region where you would get sort of fairly large, some asynchronous oscillations at approximately that time scale. But it's the main story is that it's the neural drive is too powerful compared to the stretch activation. The amount of force that you get out of it is not large enough. But you know, you might actually say, well, I could get a moth sort of over here, but in order to do that, it would have to, if it was smoothly transitioning, and of course evolution doesn't have to be smooth, but if it was smoothly transitioning, it would have to go across this bridge so that as sort of every intermediate step, it had large amplitude wing beats that it could use. But we do think that there are some insects that occupy this sort of bridge region here where they're mixing synchronous and asynchronous modes and actually you sort of operating right on that entrainment boundary. And one of the things that I think that this poses that no one's ever looked for before is it actually suggests that some insects, if they're operating right near that regime, could actually be popping back and forth from asynchronous to synchronous drive. And that's not a question anybody's ever asked before because they just assumed that that can't be there because they thought that asynchrony was this specialized thing that had to evolve the whole bunch of underlying specialized muscle machinery. So we're going back to some of the insects that we think are in that region of parameter space and sort of taking a close look at those and seeing if they're transitioning. Yeah. Uh, that was a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Um, so I was wondering um, um, whether, what do you think about maybe the dynamics that actually make the uh, muscles contract in such a way? I mean, do you think that, it, uh, I mean, what, uh, what's your opinion about the intracellular dynamics and the intracellular, cal the intracellular calcium dynamics, basically, and how calcium might be released from that? Does it, yeah. does it play a role in how you get this muscle contraction? Because uh, if I understand correctly, what, you're, what you think is happening is that the signal comes from the neuromuscular junction and then there's no other neuronal signal, right? Right, it's so not neurally based. The oscillations are intracellularly. So, the, neur uh, so the, neural, uh, the neural activation is necessary, but it's not sufficient to get the asynchronous activation. So what's happening, and the mechanism here is partially known, but it's not fully known. So what's happening in the asynchronous muscle is that there's this molecule called tropomyosin that is blocking the binding sites to myosin um, on actin filaments. And normally calcium is what torques that tropomyosin and releases the binding sites that troponin is blocking. And so that's what's happening in an 
normal muscle. In a stretch activated muscle, there's a different isoform of troponin that exists. And that isoform of troponin is not particularly sensitive to calcium activation. So the calcium comes in and it creates a little bit of exposure of those binding sites. So you get a small increase of force. But that new isoform of troponin is very stretch sensitive. So it's very mechanically sensitive. So as soon as you apply a strain to the underlying filament, it pops into a different conformation and all the binding sites pop open. So you need to have the calcium in order for the stretch activation to occur. And in fact, if you change the level of calcium, change the level of neural control, you can actually change the magnitude of that impulse response. So you can actually up and down regulate in real time the stretch activation. So there could, oddly, even though the asynchronous oscillations are sort of neurally independent, they arise just if there's neural activation, they're actually still under neural control because they can modulate the strength of that response and that's actually been shown to be the case through calcium modulation in the flight power muscles of flies. And so you have the ability to actually do neural control, even though you're not pacing the muscle at every wing strip, which I think is really cool. And maybe in a really exquisite way that animals could actually move themselves around this parameter space in, you know, <laughs> one lifespan rather than across evolutionary time. Yeah, great question. So I really like this plot and I wonder, like when I see this plot, I think like fitness landscapes. And I wonder if you can use um, this metric to model the process of evolution across this, yeah. this um, performance. And you could actually test whether this is actually mm -hmm. determining the, the evolvability of that trait. You can talk about. I think that's a fantastic idea. It's wicked hard because to parameterize this, I need to know what T naught and KR are, which means I need to do the muscle physiology in every species I want to do. I can't just measure some morphological property. So this has only been characterized in a few species so far. But one of the things that uh, Ethan in my lab is taking over from Jeff uh, now that Jeff graduated and Brett are interested in doing is trying to measure that pretty broadly. It's not that complicated of an experiment to do. We can do it just by sort of holding the muscle and stretching it and popping it and comparing that to the force that would be needed uh, by the muscle to produce a wing stroke. And that should let us proper uh, parameterize that space. And what Talia is sort of referring to is once I sort of have the properties on that evolutionary tree, one of the things that I can do is I can ask questions of like, where have the major transitions occurred, of course, but I can also ask questions like, are there certain evolutionary in, um, signatures of there being peaks in that adaptive landscape, whereas evolutionary time has gone on, have species started to cluster to certain types of, to certain regions of parameter space, and you can actually ask a little bit about where the selection, especially as body mass changes, or as the aerodynamic landscape has changed, basically, is like the, so like the Reynolds number, for example, of the species has changed. Um, is there a different region of this space that insects tend to start moving towards? So is there a region where you can give you hints, maybe why and when do you want to be synchronous or asynchronous? Because it's not just a body mass thing, because you can be asynchronous and still be big. We think it actually has a lot to do with control and maneuverability because of that ability to sort of decouple sort of frequency control and power production and do control in rapid time scales. But we're not sure. We haven't explored nearly enough the sort of trade offs of agility and stability in these systems. That's future stuff. Maybe Ellen will do that. Yeah. Is synchronous behavior be used for other forms of locomotion, or is it only going to, is flight the only thing that's going to allow you to do these high frequency? Gates. No, you could do it in anything, right? If you, um, it, you know, we even implement it with a feedback controller, right? So any, you could set up any kind of self-excited system could produce oscillations like this. So basically any time where you have the force that you're producing has state dependency in it, and then you have the appropriate sign so that it basically pulls in the opposite direction that you're being yoinked, right? You have the ability, and then if you set up antagonistic arrangement, you get add oscillation. It might be a little trickier because of the other forces that are present in the system, right? So here in, in um, you have really nice oscillatory forcing, uh, but the aerodynamic force and the elastic force and the inertial force are all nicely periodic in a wing stroke. If you have something like a leg on the ground, you've got contact forces and contact forces are, 
right? Really annoying um, and um, really fun to deal with sometimes, but may change. This. So, you know, if you have like a hybrid dynamical system, now setting up that stretch activation has to interact with those hybrid dynamics. And that's not a question I'm quite ready to answer if that could be done. But conceptually, you could set up, you know, you're just setting up a limit cycle in your system as opposed to periodically forcing it. You could do that ultimately sort of whatever I have on the right-hand side of the equation, as long as I can drive it periodically, I might be able to set up something on the left-hand side of my equation that produces state that, that produces limit cycles. And in fact, you could design your system if you know the mechanics. You could actually design the type of feedback control you would need for self-excited oscillations pretty easily, right? Because you just you you just need to be able to linearize your system, and then it's an analytical solution where you get limit cycles and where you don't. There's a question in the chat, which is, what methods did you use for the moth sys ID at the start? I imagine characterizing biological systems can be rather challenging. Um, for the system ID, I'm not sure if they mean the muscle system ID, which we sort of did, or the material system ID, or the dynamics of the moth moving. When the dynamics of the moth moving, maybe that's the question. There's We have several papers out on that. That's a whole different talk. Um, there, you wiggle a flower in front of the, uh, of the moth, and you can sort of get a frequency response uh, to the flower. And it turns out that that frequency response, you know, if you just sort of take the position of the flower and is the input and the position of the moth is the output, that system is actually empirically linear, meaning that if I scale up the inputs to the flower, or I add different frequencies in there, the whole system just scales and superimposes. I get the same frequency response regardless of the inputs that I'm doing, provided I don't sort of exceed the power capacity of the moth. And so that's actually one of the really interesting systems, even though the moth is quite complicated, the system ID that comes out of it, at least the behavioral level, level is actually a linear time invariant system that you can describe with a very simple transfer function. Um, so nothing sophisticated is the answer, which is good for the poor physicist like me, because physicists are never taught controls and feedback. Unfortunately, we're trying to change that. I think we hinted at it a little bit, but um, in terms of the synchronous versus asynchronous, is that correlated to certain behaviors or certain ecologies? It's the moth looks like it's a synectivorous. Yeah, um, yeah, but like fly, there's flies that are nectivorous too, so and they would be very asynchronous. It's it's certainly the case that you can't go above about 90 hertz and stay synchronous because the calcium dynamics can't do that. You can't drive neurally the muscle that fast. So if you want to go faster than about 90 hertz, um, then you need to be asynchronous. And as you get smaller, you have to beat your wings faster in order to sustain the appropriate lift at those size scales. So what it allows insects to do is miniaturize. And we think that the first evolution of asynchrony probably uh, co-occurred with the shrinking of insects. And interestingly, that I just realized that actually happens in evolutionary history, right when the oxygen levels are starting to drop in the atmosphere. So you're starting to get evolutionary pressure to make yourself smaller because you have to get smaller when there's less oxygen in the air for diffusion. That's one story about why insects aren't big now like they used to be, but I don't know if I believe that. I think there's also a lot of ecological roles for insects to play at small scales. So I think that's what maybe drove the initial evolution was to break that speed limit. But then the exchanges back and forth that one I don't know because there are large insects that are still asynchronous and there's definitely insects that have really pushed the limits of so there's, so there's moths that flap their wings at 90 hertz, but still do it neurally. And so I think they've sort of been captured evolutionarily in this region of param. My hypothesis is that they're caught in this region of evolutionary parameter space where it's hard to transition back to using asynchrony. You can't just turn it up because they'd have to change the time scale at the same time. But that's just a hypothesis. I don't know. But with this sort of framework now, we can sort of ask those questions and put them on the parameter space. And I think with the robo-physical system, one of the things to get back to the robotics guide is one of the really important roles that robots and robo-physical systems can play is it can ask, uh, let us ask some of those performance trade-offs right? Because it's really hard for me to go in and say, okay, Moth, I want you to suddenly beat your wings asynchronously, at, let's say 35 hertz, right? But that's exactly what we can do with the robo-physical system. So we can ask what some of those performance trade-offs are. And one of the things we're trying to do is use that robo-physical system to look at like how it responds to perturbations and perturbation recovery and frequency modulation and things like that. But I like the hypothesis that it has to do with nectar feeding. It would be cool. Sort of yeah, so thanks for the interesting talk. My question is that I saw that you used a, a robot physical system to build a, something similar to the mouse muscle, yep. right? You actually use a silicon spring, yep. a, like a motor. Yep. I, I actually wanted to know, like, uh, 
how close is that to the mouth, like muscle model? Is it like mouth model, model muscle model? Yeah. Is that like something simple or something like a not, not kind of variant a, a lot? Yes, it's, it's a static filter. It's a static filter. Yeah, so it's a static feed. The way that we implement it is as a static feedback controller. So we don't actually make the, the DC motor itself isn't like stretch activated in that same way, but we can make it state dependent by measuring the velocity on the motor and then putting that through a real time controller that implements that stretch activated response that we measured from the moth muscle. So we basically make a control that says when the motor is stretched, increase the voltage to the motor but with a particular time course that matches the kernel that we get out of the out of the stretch activation does that make sense so so think of it as i have a motor right one of the things that i can do is i can just pure oscillate the voltage driving driving that motor right but the other thing that i can do is i can say if that motor is suddenly stretched if it's driven right back driven by some perturbation to the wing or something or if it's pulled forward right now i'm going to measure that change by using just a displacement sensor and now i'm going to feed back to the motor and change the voltage to the motor based off of that state dependent signal as well it's just like doing position control but actually we're doing sort of velocity control on it but it's velocity control that actually drives the system away from its fixed points towards a limit cycle. And if you tune that properly, you get this oscillation coming out of it. Okay, so so it's a destabilizing controller in some way uh, away from the sort of fixed point of sort of coming to rest. It actually drives you to this limit cycle. Okay. If that makes sense. So, like, are there any validation of the like the model of the real mouth and the model of like this? Um, yeah, so I think that would be sort of this kind of thing. So first of all, it's a dynamically scaled system. So it's not going to precisely recapitulate the exact parameters of the moth system, but it is going to keep the aerodynamics in sort of the same region, at least with respect to Reynolds number and keep the mechanics there. And we tune the spring to have a scale version of the same stiffness as the moth system. Although it's actually hard to dynamically scale both aerodynamics and elasticity in the same way. But, you know, we get the same, that's why we did it. So we get the same profit. So this is a simulation of the moth parameters. We can put the moth on this space and we get, you know, it matches up with our simulation. We can analytically solve this simulation if we linearize the equations and show that this region is where we would expect the Hopf's bifurcation. And then we can implement that in a robophysical system and we get some properties that are fairly similar, although shifted to slightly different frequencies. So I would say that it's not, I'm not trying to make an exact model of the moth, but I'm trying to make a model of the dynamical system that produces the same kind of behavior that has this entrainment boundary between a self-excited dynamics and periodically driven dynamics and can transition between those two. So we would say that all the major dynamical features of the system are the same, even if the parameters aren't exactly the same in which way those transitions occur. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm not trying to copy the moth so far. I'm trying to make a physical model that has all of the same interesting properties, but that I can explore much more broadly because I can't change those parameters in the moth very easily. And then I'm trying to build a robotic system at scale so that we can, you know, look at what the performance benefits of that are and design cool robots for it. So, so I think we gotta go to the next meeting. Okay. But I'm happy to take a few more questions up here as people as we're packing up too. Okay. Thank you very much.